Hey all, and welcome back to Kingdom Hearts Final Mix. Now that we've got a little bit of an upgrade from Sid and Wanda, what the hell are we flying, Spa? We are flying a new gummy ship with a haste gummy that allows us to go faster for short periods of time. And we also have a better engine and better weapons, so all around just kind of a big improvement. I'm really glad I didn't look up this episode ahead of time, because damn, that's fancy as hell. But anyway, like I was saying, yeah, Sid gave us the means to travel to new Disney worlds and whatnot, and it's uh, apt that today we're going to Agrabah, uh, the world of Aladdin, Genie, Jasmine, Jafar, etc. Because sadly, not long before we were due to record this, the voice of Iago, uh, very famous comedian, Gilbert Gottfried, sadly passed away. Yeah, it's uh, very sad. I've been a little bit bummed out the past couple of days because I didn't super follow his, you know, comedian career and whatnot. But that voice has been with me since I was little, you know. And now, and now it's just not going to pop up in any future recordings and whatnot. But thankfully, we do have, you know, the Aladdin series. Uh, he was in like some episodes of uh, the Fairly Odd Parents, and obviously you have the comedy roasts and his own stand-up and whatnot. So. Uh, yeah, rest in peace, Gilbert. I distinctly remember he appeared as like a cameo in an episode of uh, the Animaniacs, where uh, the the triplets were, I guess they're not triplets, but the three kids, the Animaniacs, were like terrified that Gilbert Godfrey would show up because they didn't like his voice. And between that and Aladdin, the only things that I ever knew of him. That's not his real voice. Obviously, he puts that on for his uh, shtick and whatnot, but... Uh... So it just popped into my mind when uh, he did a uh, dramatic reading of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. That was pretty funny. Oh, right. Oh, how erotic! And obviously, shout out to Helldragon, who I would often compare to Gilbert. So, uh, hey, if there's any better tribute than, you know, talking about his passing on the episode featuring one of his most famous characters, I don't know what is. Soon enough. It's not all doom and gloom here today. We are actually entering a new phase of Kingdom Hearts. And in fact, they showed off two new games at the April 10th event in uh, Japan. And uh, one was a mobile game. Not super hype, but a missing link set after the events of Union Cross, which is uh, pretty interesting. You're going about Scarlet Ad Kylum and Disney themed worlds. It's got a little bit of a Pokemon Go aspect to it as well, but, and this is a great thing for fat blobs like me, you don't need to walk. You can apparently like spend points to travel places and whatnot, which is pretty cool. The version of Delhi Beloved they composed for the game, most probably by, you know, the queen that is Yoko Shimomura, sounds bagging. And the other game, Spa, why don't you tell the good people listening slash watching what it was? Well, they announced Platoon 3. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> of course, they announced Kingdom Hearts 4, and I'm not as excited as a lot of people probably are. I'm excited for it, for sure. Uh, I'm definitely interested to see what's coming ahead in the series, but I don't know. I, I think I need to see more. The one thing I really want is to see the trailer or the, the release announcement in English, or at least with English subtitles so I can kind of tell what's happening, because I did miss out on a lot of what was happening because it's all Japanese voice acting with no subtitles. Have you not gone back and watched it? They put it up, like, pretty soon after the original one dropped. That is my own fault. Yeah, I have not gone back to do that. <laughs> oh, so yeah, you had one job for this playthrough, and you failed to do it. Actually, no, you had one job, but that was to show up. And you did do it today, so thank you very much. But, uh, yeah, obviously, we're in Quadratum now, in Kingdom Hearts 4. And uh, they've said, like, one of the main themes of the game, and this excites me quite a bit, actually, is dealing with the whole fact that this is a fictional world to Sora, but when Sora's in that world, he's fictional to the people of Quadratum. So, it would be kind of funny if, like, I think, Spy, you said on Twitter earlier, if we saw posters for Kingdom Hearts 4 being advertised and whatnot. If we see advertisements for Kingdom Hearts 4 in Quadratum in Kingdom Hearts 4, then the universe is going to explode. <laughs> it's kind of funny, at the end of that trailer, we saw Dora Goofy, the regular, like, KH3 style, more cartoony style, uh, to contrast uh, Sora's more semi photorealistic Final Fantasy look in Quadratum. Yeah, they were basically going what I assume is the underworld, 
looking for what I assume, or who I assume, is Hades, because that was very clearly uh, James Wood's Japanese counterpart at the end of that. And it's so funny, the people on Twitter are saying, imagine your best friend dies and the first place you search is hell. <laughs> that is interesting to think about, yeah. There's like so many like bits and pieces that we'd be here the whole part talking about Kingdom Hearts 4. So uh, I guess I'll just wrap up by saying I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, if we ever do get round to it, uh, presuming we haven't turned to dust by the time it releases, that'll probably be like me, Tanner, and Richie. Uh, this is a special kind of thing for Spy. He's more of a stream kind of go. Yeah, uh, for those that don't know, I've been having a rough time with uh, basically everything, for lack of a better explanation. But uh, I'm doing okay, and, uh, you know, friends and stuff are helping, so. Also, like I said, I appreciate all the support that I've gotten from viewers and comments and the Discord messages and stuff like that, so. Yeah, it, it's all been pretty good lately. And now I'm starting to tear up a bit. <laughs> oh, shush. You're a good lad. We're all a bit mad. Gilbert's passing made me sad. Sorry, I, I, I had to wrap it around for like a rhyme and whatnot, so I don't get too depressed over here. But you know, speaking of Gilbert again, um, it's kind of funny that not long before his passing, we actually rewatched Aladdin and the King of Thieves, and uh, not long after that, I was watching a clip of uh, Norm Macdonald, who also sadly passed away this year. What is it with comedians dropping like flies this year? Uh, must be. A coincidence. It's just a bloody coincidence, Tom. Come on now. <laughs> but it, it's really weird. Like, obviously, these things have no effect on the real world, but we as humans look for patterns, so you kind of put two and two together. But, um, yeah, like, we would watch those things, and then soon after, Gilbert would pass. But um, I, I'm just getting to the point where I'm kind of rambling now, and I don't want to be too tacky and whatnot and turn this into just, like, a whole thing about Gilbert's passing. Because, you know, he was so much more than just a dead comedian. He was a real funny guy. And uh, from my here, a super cool family man as well. So uh, let's get back to Agrabah and whatnot. Now you have seen all three films Spa, what order, in terms of quality, would you put them in? Well, my viewing of the second movie counts as what's in Kingdom Hearts 2, because... Uh, that's basically the only version of that that I've actually seen, and I think it's the only version that anyone needs to see, judging from what I've heard of it. I would definitely say 1-3-2. Uh, the first movie, easily the best one. Uh, King of Thieves is really good, but eh, it suffers from lack of budget, and Return of Jafar just kind of shouldn't exist. Yeah. Uh, I liked Return of Jafar at the time. I guess looking back, uh, it was more like there are lots of shiny jewels in that film, so maybe uh, my magpie-like tendencies blinded me to the truth that it was just a kind of mid-pilot for the television series, which thankfully was much better. Huh, I actually, again, because we didn't have Disney where I lived growing up, it wasn't in our cable service, I never got to see any of those television series. And going back now, it's like, you know, however many episodes, so that's a lot of time commitment. So I don't know that I could force myself to get through that, but maybe I'll look into it at some point. Thankfully, we still have Dan Castellaneta as Genie here. He would uh, take over Robin Williams' role in uh, the TV series, as well as Return of Jafar, I think. Yeah, I think that was his uh, first role as Genie. I don't know who voices him nowadays. I'm honestly not the biggest fan, but, uh, you know, you stick with a voice for so long, and then like someone slightly different comes along. And I guess it's just human nature to be a little bit off-put. Yeah, Robin Williams was very upset about uh, how the genie was portrayed in the first movie. His agreement with Disney was basically that the genie would not be front and center in marketing and stuff for the original movie. And then Disney said, hey, what if we did that anyway? And so, of course, the genie is front and center, very prominent on the original poster for Aladdin. And Robin Williams was very upset about it. And so he did not return for Return of Jafar. He did come back for King of Thieves. Don't really think it was strictly necessary, because I don't think Genie was super important to that film. But it was nice to have him back regardless. You could immediately feel Robin's touch in terms of a lot of the jokes and whatnot. They would just, like, record him and, like, use 
loads and loads of like takes and sift through them and choose the best ones because he was just a natural performer, really. Famous one to those is the cappuccino machine, as it's mentioned right here. Excellent timing on my part. <laughs> also mentioned in uh, Recoded. You can find the peddler as the like item shop, and uh, if you don't buy anything from him, he offers you a cappuccino machine instead if you don't buy anything, which I think is pretty funny. Ah, uh, wonderful. Jasmine? Oh, that's right! I was just thinking about uh, other versions of Agrabah throughout the series. Uh, obviously, we have, you know, its debut here. Uh, we have it in two, which, as Spa said, is the adaptation of Return of Jafar. I'm trying to think, it wasn't in Birth by Sleep. It was in Days, because I remember, I think about that was like Aladdin trying to fix the town without Genie's help. Uh, was it in Dream Drop Distance? Was it recoded? Yes, it was, because uh, I just kind of cut you off there and answered my own question. But uh, there's a thing with, like, a cyber Jafar using the world on the town, and you've, like, got to get away from him and whatnot. Again, recoded was originally coded, and it was a phone game that was episodic in Japan. So I guess they kind of had to get a little bit creative with uh, reusing these worlds. You do that? It's actually really neat. Uh, I, again, I love a lot of the gimmicks in Recoded. Agrabah's pretty normal from a gameplay perspective. You're kind of just playing the game normally. The gimmick comes from the time. Uh, like, like you said, Jafar basically stops time throughout the whole town. And if he finds you, he steals some of the time you have available. And if you run out, you game over, of course. And you have to keep running around to find Iago in order to escape. And, uh... You know, that, it's actually pretty interesting. It's one of the last Disney Worlds. I think it is the last Disney World in Recoded, actually, because after that, I think the game goes to Hollow Bastion. Yep, uh, the original KH World, the one selected for Smash Bros. as the level and whatnot. Uh, do you think that was the right choice? Like, because there's other uh, original locations. I mean, Hollow Bastion and Radiant Garden are kind of the same thing, but you also have Traverse Town. I think Hollow Bastion is, like, the most iconic because it's included at least in most of if not all of the games in some fashion i think traverse town would have also worked but they would have probably incorporated some of the stuff from dream drop distance which is maybe not as well known so i think they went for kh1 uh which is how Sora was revealed in his kh1 outfit as well so they wanted the iconic kh1 nostalgia kind of thing uh that they had going People like to talk about, oh, how Kingdom Hearts 3 is the worst game in the series, and it did this wrong and that wrong. The only thing it did wrong to me, per se, is not adapting the third Aladdin film, because I wanted to go to the hideout of the 40 Thieves, I wanted to fight, you know, Persian Wolverine, I wanted to, you know, fly carpet above the Vanishing Isle, and, you know, fight for the Hand of Midas, and whatnot, and that would be a really cool Keyblade that, I don't know, maybe turned heartless into gold and whatnot, but no. Now we're going to the real world, and who knows, we're gonna have a fucking Boy Meets World level. <laughs> what if we go to the real world and we get to uh, Agrava in KH4, but it's the live-action adaptation? You've never said such a hurtful thing to me throughout the entirety of our friendship, Jesus Christ. <laughs> God, I, I had a little shuffy at uh, Jasmine's original song for that film. And was that woman not given vocal lessons? Because I swear she's out of tune like 75% of the time. I don't like to talk about people like that, but it was like, you couldn't not notice it. The thing about the original songs for the most part is that they just kind of have the actors do it instead of having someone that knows how to sing do it. Yeah. This was a big problem in the live action Beauty and the Beast where they had Emma Watson trying to sing and they didn't give her a whole lot of direction and she was having to sing while walking around and doing a lot of motions and it just really didn't turn out that well from what I've heard and uh, the problem was just they just don't have what they need for these people to be able to sing these songs if they're trying to do them live on set instead of dubbing over them with a studio recording. But hey, you know, if we're in the real world, why don't we get a bed knobs and broomsticks level? That'd be pretty cool. Setting your sights a little high. 
Aren't you, boy? Ah, uh, Jonathan Freeman, wonderful as always, as Jafar. I, I think he's, like, part of the Broadway adaptation of Aladdin. Jasmine. Don't quote me on that. So but uh, he's a, a big old Broadway guy. I wouldn't know about that. I do know of a stage play that's based on Aladdin. I think the title is Twisted, or something like that, that follows Jafar's story and really deepens the character and adds a lot of things that are going on to make him not so wahaha sinister villain kind of thing. I mean, I've only watched a review of it. I haven't seen the actual play, although I would love to at some point. But just the idea of it sounds fantastic. Jafar is obviously still a villain, but you're kind of seeing the sympathetic side of him and why he wants to do these things, like uh, lost love compelling him to like try to take over uh, because of whatever happened that caused that and things like that. So uh, that's that's really cool. Being on a spa, did you have trouble with the parts that defeat when you first played the game? Uh, probably. I honestly couldn't tell you. I probably had more trouble with the um, Tiger Head Cave of Wonders that comes up after this. Uh. I honestly don't remember having a lot of trouble with this specific boss when I was a kid. Granted, I also played on beginner most of the time, where no boss is really a problem if you're paying even a modicum of attention. <laughs> Ooh, modicum, bringing out the $10 words. <laughs> Damn, you fucking destroyed that lad. I am uh, significantly overpowered for Agrabah at this point. Spent a little bit too much grinding for my recording, but I also hate Pots and Heat. It is the bane of existence for speedrunners. No matter the category, no matter the difficulty, that fight is always, always a pain for speedrunners because they're never leveled up enough to fight it. <laughs> uh, other Aladdin voice actors here. Uh, Scott Weiner as, uh, well, Aladdin. Let's see, he was on, yeah, Full House, and the Netflix sequel, Fuller House, funnily enough. But he's basically been Aladdin since 1992, so, goddamn. I guess Disney treats their legends well, I guess. One of the few series that got back uh, most of the voice actors for, you know, all the roles for this game, of course, uh, Genie being the exception because Robin Williams was a bit too high profile for the budget of this game. But they also brought back Linda Larkin for Jasmine, which surprised me because I'm going to be honest, I don't think she does a great job in this game. I don't know if that's direction or the fact that she hasn't voiced the character in a long time, but uh, I don't know. Maybe she's just out of her element. I can't say. I'm going to say it's a direction thing because, like, at points in 2, where she has more dialogue, she sounds better. But of course there is the infamous Sora, Donald, Goofy! Yeah, that's a pretty bad one. I think a lot of it also comes down to your perception of how something sounds can also be colored by what's on the screen. KH1 has a lot of default face, especially for Jasmine. Yeah. Mm. It kind of makes you think everything sounds worse than it is, even when it's already a little bit bad. It's a bad combo, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Last bit of voice acting trivia. Uh, more like singing trivia, really. Uh, Leia Salonga was actually the singing voice for both Jasmine and... I'm going to throw this to you, Spark. Can you name the other Disney princess, so to speak? Was it Ariel? No, it was Mulan. Oh, okay. No, of course it's not Ariel. That's Jody Benson. <laughs> the goat, as it were. Aside from voice actor trivia, I have a bit of trivia about the movie itself that I looked up that I found pretty interesting. It was actually the highest grossing film in the year it was released in 1992. Wow. Earning over $504 million worldwide, which is a ton of money. That beat out a lot of things, uh, which is pretty impressive. It was also the highest grossing animated film of all time until The Lion King came out two years later. Which, I mean, if you're going to lose a title to something, at least you're going to lose it to The Lion King, so that's fair enough. If I were to be objective and not just select my favorites, I would say Aladdin, Lion King, and probably The Little Mermaid are the top three Renaissance films. I would say probably Aladdin and Hercules, and I would have to watch some of the others again to give you a, uh, a really good list for the rest of them, because those are the ones that I've seen 
moderately recently, so I can't say much for the others. Fair enough, mate. Yeah, it's really nice that they came to me and said we want to adapt your bedroom, and uh, here it is. I don't really care for them calling it the dark chamber, though. That's a bit insensitive. <laughs> so you have to come this way first in order to progress, progress, to say the word properly, in the Cave of Wonders, because if you actually go the upper path all the way, you find that you're blocked off and you have to come down here anyway. Right. So I figured I would just go this way first, because this is already a long part, and I didn't want it to take ten extra minutes. Not really all that hidden. You know, the entrance wasn't blocked or anything, and this is the thing you gotta hit to uh, open the way. There is a hidden part of the chamber that you saw that jewel up there uh, that we actually need high jump to access. So we'll have to come back for that later. That's probably not going to be on screen. In fact, I know it's not because I've already done the recording. <laughs> I think you get a set of Dalmatians and a Haste 2 gummy, which is actually the earliest time you can access that. Uh, much better than the Haste gummy that I have equipped on the ship now. Interesting. Oh, Genie. Always bound to servitude. Also, why did you put your slave bands back on in, like, the Aladdin series and whatnot? I don't know. They also, like, give him legs and then take him back away so that his legs are kind of wispy again later on. So, like, I don't know if they just never remain consistent with that or what. I, maybe some days he just likes having legs. Spa. I don't judge. Legs are pretty nice. <laughs> I ain't saying nothing. I'm not giving Flame any isolated audio to use against me. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, was that a white Trinity mark I saw there? I believe it was actually a yellow one uh, that pushes the thing that's there back down so that you can access that hidden area possibly without high jump, I think. There's two ways to get to the hidden area I mentioned. It's either high jump or having yellow trinity to push that block down to be able to access it easier. You get high jump a long time before you get the yellow trinity, though. Nice to see that gravity also affects the fat lads, the fat bodies and whatnot. And let me tell you, that's accurate to real life right there. The gravity spell does damage based on your max MP like all magic does in this game. All of your magic damage is based on that, which the game doesn't explain clearly. Gravity also does damage based on how much HP an enemy has left out of their max HP, so if they're at full health, it's going to do a lot more than if they're like at 10% or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, gravity, sort of related to space, and what turned up in the most recent KH4 trailer spot? Uh, you're going to have to jog my memory for that one. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so there was... A beautiful, again, almost photorealistic, like, scene of a forest. And if you pause at one point and look at, like, the top right of the screen, you can clearly see what looks like the back of an ATST's foot. That's right, one of the chicken walkers from bloody Star Wars. It's known that Namora really likes Star Wars, and given that Quadratum is a fictional place, it would make a lot of sense to bring in, like, fictional heroes, like Luke Skywalker and whatnot. I'm just kind of really hoping we get, say, uh, Darth Vader boss fight, because holy shit, that would be awesome. I forget what they're actually called figure-wise, but he did some, like, redesigns of Darth Vader, uh, I think there's a Boba Fett one, maybe some Stormtroopers, but they're typical Namora style, but, uh, minus the belts and zippers. But uh, they look pretty sick. As does his Batman one. I think he did a Batman one. Anyway, but uh, you can look up like comparisons between you know that image of the foot in the trailer and an actual ATSD's foot. It's almost one for one. So if it turns out that it's not that, I have no friggin' idea what it could be. The forest where it happens is also very similar to an area in one of the Star Wars video games. I think I can't remember it off the top of my head though. Oh, you might be thinking of the forest moon of Endor, mate. Might have been, yeah. That bit where Maleficent just disappears without answering Sora is one of the most funny parts of the game, and also this... <laughs> KH1 has some, like, bizarre cutscene direction, and honestly, it only adds to the charm. There's something weird that happens sometimes where the scene will just pause, before moving on, like, before someone reacts to something. 
it happens specifically in a scene with Riku that might be at the end of this part, where he just kind of doesn't react for a full five seconds after someone else finishes speaking. And it's very noticeable and strange. <laughs> I have to wonder if it's like the game is loading the next piece of dialogue, which would be weird in a cutscene that's already running, though, since I don't know, like, how the cutscenes are generated, if they're, uh, generated while the game is running, or if they're, they already have the whole video file done. Depends on what it is. It's a bit weird. Uh, d don't worry about that distressing mound in the middle of the room. Uh, it will be gone, surely, but in the meantime, we got to beat up an old man with a stick, and uh, all the while Genie is apologetically, mind you, but still trying to beat our asses. And trust me, you don't want to fuck with Jins. They're evil. He runs around and will warn you when he's attacking because he's being forced to do this by Jafar mm -hmm. uh, as part of the Genie contract, I guess. Uh, most of the time he's just kind of flying around minding his own business because, hey, it's not like he was given a timetable or anything. Exactly. You know, attack him. Maybe within the next half hour or so. You know, come on, we're on a strict schedule here. <laughs> it's just like that episode of SpongeBob. Eh, I don't really feel like it. <laughs> Surprisingly, Jafar is not immune to magic. You'd think he would, like, be completely immune to it, being a wizard in his own right. But uh, he actually takes a pretty decent bit of damage if you can find a good spot to shoot some fires at him. Now, see, I understand why you would go with that train of thought, but that's like saying like, I'm invulnerable to snow because I'm white. I don't know. I think that's a pretty different comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never really was very good at coming up with arguments on the spot. Same. <laughs> oh, he's almost done. I don't know what causes Jafar to run away like that. I've seen plenty of fights where you can actually reach him before he decides to float away. I guess that's just people with better movement than what I have. <laughs> Possibly. And away he goes. Kind of like an evil Navi. Fire! I think uh, one more set of attacks should be enough to finish him off here. Donald had him dead to rights, but was doing fuck all. I mean, that's a pretty good description of Donald, let's be honest. <laughs> He's just saving up for the Zeta Flare. We all know this now. Donald is surprisingly good in KH1 when he actually attacks because his magic levels up at the same time as Sora's. Uh -huh. So like when you get improved magic, Donald gets the same improvements. That does not carry over in KH2 where Donald always has the base level of all of his magic spells, which is why I think he's a lot less useful in that one. Mm. Ooh, Blazara, nice. And we'll be making plenty of use of that in the next boss fight uh, that will be coming up here shortly to such a point that I'm actually going to change my uh, shortcuts on the video, which I don't normally do. <laughs> uh, very good, very good. I'm glad to see you keep Cure on X, mate. Of course. It just means you can just spam the button to cure Sora. You don't have to worry about what button you're pressing. It was so weird in, like, KH3 when you switch to playing as Riku and Cure's on, like, Circle or whatever. Yeah, it's so odd. I really wish you could change his shortcuts, but obviously that's not an option. All right, you want to have all the rules and whatnot, be my guest. He's tingling all the way down. And that's what the mound was for. It was concealing an entrance to a big old lair. I don't know why. I, I guess all the lava here is like what we see in the movie when Aladdin's escaping. Uh, I think he has to, like, escape from lava rising or something like that. Yeah. This particular arena is reused in Chain of Memories and Rechain of Memories, and also recoded for the fights with Jafar. And I'm gonna be honest, none of those are particularly fun. Jafar is one of the bosses that is the least fun to fight in this whole series, I think. Well, at least this incarnation of the uh, GD fight. The one in two is fine, because you get to fly about on carpet and whatnot. The RE Coded one stands out a lot because you basically have to do some platforming to uh, reach Jafar or Iago. You're basically chasing him around an arena, you jump on blocks, and uh, not fun to do with a keyboard, let me tell you that. But uh, yeah, it's not too bad with an actual uh, DS, 3DS, or a controller. Yeah, it's not too bad. I have 
problems with the platforming in that game because uh, I've only played it. Well, I know I, I have played it on an actual DS, but playing it emulated is weird because sometimes the controller doesn't like uh, up left, up right, like uh, diagonal inputs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what I usually do is I have it so that um, I can only go up, down, left, or right. There is no diagonal input, which helps when you're trying to go in the right direction. It does not help when you're trying to do platforming. Oh, bless you, Spaw, oh, bless you. Oh, I'm sad now. Because you heard Gilbert? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just watching someone react to a Moon Knight episode the other day, and they started singing Arabian Nights because they were in Egypt. I'm like, damn it, I can't get away from the grief. <laughs> oh, no. Better to remember the happy times. I, I, I'm acting like I fucking knew the guy. I didn't know the guy. And again, okay, I don't want to be too tacky, so why don't we just stuck Jafar in the lamp and be done with it? Unfortunately, Iago also gets stuck in the lamp. Oh yeah, I forgot that aspect. Somehow he escapes, which is what leads to Return of Jafar, but I don't know if they ever explain that part. And then they gave Gilbert Gottfried his own song, which, um... Yeah, that was that was a thing to uh, paraphrase Richie. <laughs> I'm actually surprised by how much is left after beating the boss. Agrippa is quite the long world for KH1 uh, because of all the stuff that happens after the boss fight is done. Take your eyes off a princess for one second, and someone comes in and just snatches her up. That's actually Riku as we are about to find out here shortly, that comes and kidnaps her. And that's why Agrabah appears in the first set of worlds for Riku's story in Rechain of Memories. The first set oh. of worlds that he has in that game are all worlds that he visited in this game. Hollow Bast or not Hollow Bast, Traverse Town, Agrabah, and Neverland. Those kind of worlds are in the first set because he went there. Yeah. The second set of worlds that he gets are all ones that he did not see at all. So he has no experience with them. Interesting. He does start in Hollow Bastion, though, doesn't he? That's right, he does, yeah. That's one of the fancier keyholes. I always thought that was like uh, the Sands of Time kind of thing, because Prince of Persia came out around a similar time as this game. So I always thought that was kind of a reference to that, but I guess it's just kind of sand. It's everywhere, get used to it. <laughs> Oh man, oh Jesus, I can't see them, they're going so fast. This must have been one of the points back on, like, the original PlayStation 2 where the screen was so dark that you couldn't see anything. Also, yeah, you can attack and do flips on this carpet for those that don't know. Oh, interesting. Well, obviously attack is, you know, the normal button. You uh, do flips with square as, as you would do a dodge roll, basically, is what it's for. I don't know how much it actually helps if it gives you any invincibility frames. It certainly didn't help there because I'm getting the shit kicked out of me. Kind of reminiscent of uh, the escape sequence in the Super Nintendo version, at least, of Aladdin. I don't know if it's in the Mega Drive one. I have no experience with those. Good. <laughs> They didn't want to pay Jim Cummings to reprise his role as the a big old tiger head, I guess. Which is weird, because he's everywhere else in this game. <laughs> really? Pretty sure that's uh, Jim Cummings, anyway. Uh, Earth to Al? Hello, you still have one wish left. It was always a bit weird when they go from like the dialogue cutscenes, well, the text cutscenes to the dialogue-filled ones. There's one earlier in this world when uh, Sora, Donald, and Goofy first find Jasmine that goes from a voice cutscene to a text box cutscene back to a voice cutscene, and it's so strange, and I don't understand why it's like that. I'm gonna look up who played the Cave of Wonders while I just. Marvel, <laughs> genie's legs and whatnot. Now you can go anywhere you want. Except, don't, because we need you. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> okay, it wasn't Jim Cummings, but it was another guy with a, a huge filmography. It was actually Frank Welker, uh, also the voice of Abu. Yeah, he does a lot of the animal voices for Disney stuff, like Abu and like tigers and stuff like that. But a favor? Now that's entirely different. Haha, loopholes. I guess I could give that a try. After all, we're pals, right, Al? Genie. I like how animated the genie is Just in this world, more so than probably how he is in 2. 2 is a lot more static, I think, with the genie, but he really adds a lot of life to Agrava and the game in general, let's be honest. There's too much default face, so the genie brings a lot of life to the game. <sighs> that smarmy vizier could have had him. If someone had stuck around to give him a hand... Now, is this in the base game, or is it a final mix thing? This is the base game. I'm pretty sure any of the... In the original final mix, any of the added scenes would have had, uh, no voice acting. Because the original final mix had English voice acting with Japanese subtitles. Because it was only released in Japan, and people liked the English voice actors better. Uh, for whatever reason. And so, they didn't record any new lines for the Final Mix exclusive scenes. And a lot of the stuff that's in this version is actually reused dialogue, uh, like we'll see in some cases later on. There's one of those pauses you were talking about. That's the one that I was thinking of when I was saying it earlier. It takes so long for him to react and it's really strange. Oh, I love Captain Hook, he's one of my favorite Disney villains. Why are you doing all this for me? I'm actually planning to rewatch Peter Pan before we get to uh, Neverland. If you would like to watch that together, shit, yeah, buddy. You're like a son to me. I only want you to be happy. Get off of me, you old wench! Stranger danger. Believe what you wish. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Like Jafar and Maleficent seem to have an okay relationship compared to Maleficent and the rest of the Disney League of Evil. Hades can't stand her, probably because he understands like how much of a manipulative bitch she is. Oogie doesn't give a shit. Ursula's just off doing whatever. And you know, Captain Hook, he's just clearly in it for the money. Captain Hook has no idea what's going on because we'll hear later, he doesn't even know what Maleficent is planning or who all of the princesses of heart are that they're actually looking for. But now that we're done with Agrabah itself, there's something else to show off that we mentioned before. Uh -huh. Now that we have completed the world and sealed the keyhole, there are NPCs around. Hey, Waka, what's up? <laughs> uh, it's, it's not me, man. Definitely not taking a summer job, nah. But yeah, a lot of people tend to not see this, because why would you stick around in Agrabah? I mean, there's a perfectly good warp point right there. You get thrown into uh, Aladdin's house, which has a save point where you can leave, so... It makes sense that uh, people wouldn't find out about this. I wonder what happens if you try to go back to the Cave of Wonders at this point, actually. Because that I don't know about. Is it just gone? Or can you still access it and there's just no Heartless there? Mysteries upon mysteries upon mysteries, Spark. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait for someone in the comments to tell us, because we are just hack frauds until the end of time, I guess. All right, folks, that'll do it for this part of Kingdom Hearts Final Mix. We'll see you next time when our journey through the Disney worlds of yore continue. Bye for now.